Hello, this is Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer. Welcome home. Soar into tower. We are ready for takeoff. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas. Hey, it's Amy from DVC Clubhouse. Hey, Clubbers, it's Scott from DVC Clubhouse. Hey, it's Kathleen from DVC Clubhouse. Welcome aboard, it's Phil from DVC Clubhouse. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Debrief Podcast brought to you by DVC Clubhouse. This is Amy, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-hosts, Phil, Scott, and Kathleen. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Howdy, y'all. Welcome aboard, guys. How'd that go now that you read it off a cue card? Uh, even at that, I almost couldn't get it out because Scott had that. Scott has this go ridiculous ahead, grin on his face. <laughs> is that what that is? Ridiculous grin? All it takes is a smile. <laughs> Scott just smiled at you and your heart was all a flutter. You couldn't speak. <laughs> so you fanning yourself with your hand. No, I'm looking at Scott's ridiculous grin and that he has today he every time we do this for you know for our listeners scott puts a different name down like he, our names are all at the bottom of of the the rectangles that our video was appearing in and so scott always puts different names or different ridiculousness on his and so today he's he's acting like he doesn't know what i'm talking about mine says scott he put kathy because he knows i hate Kathy. I'm the only one allowed to call you Kathy. No, you're not allowed to call me I'm going to pay for this later. I know I am. And I have a new mission in life. I want all the clubhouse members to now refer to her as Kathy. No. <laughs> <laughs> you call me Kathy and Kathy's going to come out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So anyway, even though I, I, I did make myself a little cue card because, you know, the last couple of times it's been a little dicey. I feel like the longer I do this, the, the more I mess up. So I wrote it down and then, but I still couldn't get almost get through it because Scott and his shenanigans over there. It why is moderate. it every, yeah, why is it every time you make a mistake, it's somehow Scott's fault? I smile. Because it's, it always is his fault. And he I knows. I smiled. Yeah. That, okay. That's it. I'm not even allowed to smile. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that line from Wedding Crashers. You shut your mouth when you're talking to me. You shut your mouth. <laughs> Good movie. Oh, all right. So anyway, this week, we're going to have a conversation about some of the magical extras on property. Last week, we talked about the best resorts for resort only stay and today we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do during the resort only stay as well as some of the magical extras that are available at the parks because if you're somebody like phil and wants to cheat as he said last time and buy an extra a ticket for an after hours event we're going to talk about some of those as well so I'm a rule breaker. What can I say? Yeah. Poor Doug just can't get a straight answer out of me on any of his Would You Rather Wednesdays. Yeah, well, and for our listeners, if you don't know what Phil is talking about, over on our Facebook page, DVC Clubhouse, um, one of our members does a, a Would You Rather Wednesday. So a little shout out to Doug for his his Would You Rather Wednesdays, where he presents two kind of absurd scenarios and awful options and we are as members of the group if we choose to participate need to pick which we would rather do between the two absurd options so if if that sounds like something you'd enjoy join us over at dvc clubhouse on facebook anyway back to the matter at hand so we're going to talk about some magical extras and so i know in the past couple of years, I've done some really, some really cool things. And I know everyone fights when I, when I call on them first. <laughs> so Better who wants to volunteer? 
<laughs> Who wants to volunteer to go first this time? I won't call on anybody. Kathy has a list. Kathy? Oh. <laughs> Good thing this show is not viewable. <laughs> and that's why we can't have a Patreon, people. <laughs> <laughs> so I did make a list. And some of these things are things that we have done. Some of them I would like to do. I'll just start with the things that we've done that were extras. Uh, We really enjoyed the Christmas and Halloween parties at uh, Magic Kingdom. We've done dessert parties. I didn't enjoy it. (laughs) Speak for yourself. (laughs) All right. Well, I've done the spa and I really enjoyed that at the Grand Floridian. Never got to do that. Um, I really do enjoy the water parks. I don't think he does, but I do. Can't swim. Almost drowned when I was a kid. Not fun for me. Go ahead. Good thing you can't drown at the water park there. You can drown in eight ounces of water, but anyway, continue with this list. Your wife is a nurse. I see bareback riding on there. Well, sorry, horseback riding. (laughs) Okay. All right. (laughs) You've locked her up. So other things I have listed that I would like to do. Our Keys to the Kingdom tour, the Wild Africa Trek, and Savor the Savannah, which I think uh, we are actually going to be doing that soon with uh, a couple other members, Tom and Pam. What else? Oh, I'd like to do a fireworks cruise too. So those are, that's kind of my list. I have a little more, I have a couple more, but I'll let someone else talk. I think we should peel apart the parties first because... I think everyone here has done the parties and five, six, seven years ago, I would have chosen to go to a party every opportunity I got in this last year or two that has completely turned around for me. We did a Christmas party this year and it has caused me to not want to go back to a Christmas party just because of the crowds and what I feel are kind of the reduced offerings and it it really wasn't quite the magical experience that it was just a few years ago. What's everyone else's feeling recently? That's why I said I really didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I was going to just because it used to be an exclusive party. You paid for it. There was less people. And reasonably affordable. It was never cheap, but it was reasonably affordable. You felt like you got your money's worth out of it. And now it just feels like a typical day at the park because they just sell too many tickets for it. So that's Christmas party and Halloween. I've had that experience at both. We actually said at the party this year, we were walking through the park and I said, this feels like a Sunday afternoon at Magic Kingdom. There was no exclusive slow feel to it one bit. The ride lines were out of control. Even the late parade was packed and typically you could always get the late parade and and get a good viewing spot and they were still five ten deep everywhere along the parade route and the tickets are 75 percent more expensive than they were just a few years ago the prices keep going up there's more people in the park and hey i've said it before it's a capitalist system right as long as people are paying they're going to keep hosting it i just don't think they're going to get my money anymore not until it changes or if it changes that's how we feel and we lived 30 minutes away. I wouldn't, you know, I want to go to things like that when they come up. I want to experience that stuff every year. And now I feel like, you know, why? If you're going to spend that much money, what are you getting out of it? Totally agree. I was so disappointed. Well, in fairness, I haven't been back to Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party. I went when it was Boo Bash, when they brought it back after COVID. So I haven't been to an actual Mickey's Not So Scary since probably like 2010 or 11 but i went to mickey's very merry christmas party and i imagine that the halloween party is the same way i i I just found that the lines for the special snacks were long the lines for all of the attractions were were long it just felt like I'm, i'm kind of like losing my patience with going to the parks and always feeling like I'm shoulder to shoulder with people. And when you're paying close to $200 per person to go to one of these parties and you feel like you're just, you know, cramped in there with people again who are all trying to 
get the snacks, find the viewing area, ride the rides. It just, it, it has totally lost that feeling of feeling like you're kind of alone in the park. You know, like that's the thing that was so great about it was that you were, you didn't have to pick and choose. Like if you look at any of the, the um, videos that the influencers do and they kind of tell you what to like how to strategize and what you should if you want to prioritize snacks then here's what you should do or if you want to prioritize entertainment then you should do this and I just feel like I should be able to do it all I shouldn't have to prioritize something what are you all laughing at what what did I say this time what you did can't I do? hear Parker in the background no I can't. you can't you can't hear Parker in the background but you also can't see what Parker just did but Anyway, that probably had not, for the best. Had nothing to do with you, Amy. I, was, I was like, just, I must have said something ridiculous. Oh, I see Parker now. She hey, just Parker. decided to jump up and start humping Kathleen's arm. But anyway, that's okay. <laughs> so, in the vein of after hours parties, I think we've all bashed not so scary and very merry numerous times. Has anybody been to the after hours parties outside of Christmas and Halloween? Because we in the past, I've had some phenomenal experiences with those. I have photos of us going through Magic Kingdom for an after-hours party where there are literally two people ahead of us in all of Frontierland. And that's something we had said we would go back and do, but now I'm a little circumspect based on what the holiday parties have been. I have not done it. And Phil, it, the reason why I have not done it is because you, in fact, talked me out of doing it at Magic Kingdom, remember? Yeah, probably. I was thinking about when I was there in the beginning of February, because there was going to be an after hours party at Magic Kingdom. I was thinking about doing it and you convinced me not to do it. Yeah, I don't I think that had fence. to do with the crowds. I, I recall having the conversation, but I don't remember what the basis of it was and why we decided that it probably wasn't the best usage of time or money. But in the past, we have had amazing experiences there my only complaint about them is that they have been fairly short for what you get but what we have done in the past is gotten a babysitter for the kids and that was the evening that emily and i would go out for just a quick little adult night in the parks without the kids just to relax and wander around i'd be very curious to hear maybe we'll post the question on our page who has been to one lately and what their experience has been because those were always really enjoyable for us and if they still have that feel to them which i doubt we would be interested in doing that again, but I'm not going back to a Christmas party until something changes. Are the regular ones daily? Special days? Like after hours? They're special days. I can pull up the schedule while you guys are talking, but yeah, they're, they're not infrequent. Another thing that I will probably never spend my money on again is a dessert party at Magic Kingdom. That to me was... Just a lot of money again for mediocre dessert. And if you're not a drinker, it doesn't make sense at all. And even if you are a drinker, unless you're like going to go in there and start like slamming like six beers to get your money's worth, you really only have time for, I had time for one drink and a couple of desserts before they bring you over to the viewing area. I mean, it is nice to be able to get an upfront viewing area without needing to, to wait around and you know reserve your spot but i don't know it's just not worth it for me i just feel like that was a lot of money for a very mediocre experience and that whole i mean i that tomorrowland terrace over there it just feels like an outdoor cafeteria to me so i mean maybe if they set it up in a place where you felt like you had like special access to a cool place like maybe that would be nice but i don't know it just I, I'm not interested in, in spending money on that again. That was a one and done for me. Yeah, we've we've only done it one time, and that was for the return of Happily Ever After. I liked it. I thought Did it was okay. Did we have the pre or the post? We had the pre, we but we wish we would have got the post party. Because I think we would have had more time to relax, drink what we want, eat what we want, and not feel rushed to hurry up and get into that. I don't room. have to do it again. I'm just glad we did it for the return of... I thought it was okay. I mean, I honestly, if I had a choice between paying for that or paying for a Christmas party again, I would probably do a dessert party. So that's just my preference. Has anyone ever done one other than Magic Kingdom? Because that's the only one we've ever done. No. 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 
I mean, if you count my if you count my wedding, we did uh, we did a private dessert party at Epcot watching Illuminations, which was amazing. But it was you know a pro- uh, an entire area of everyone that I knew. So I mean, that was pretty awesome. Yeah, we did as Scott mentioned the post party, and for us it was twofold. Number one, if you do the pre party. You go and you kind of feel rushed, not just because the fireworks are coming up, but because they kind of pack you into that cordoned off area on the AstroTurf right in front of the castle. And our concept was we were going to get into that area as soon as it opened and get the kids right up on the fence. so They had the best possible viewing spot. And then we could relax and enjoy ourselves afterwards versus doing the pre-party where you feel like you need to rush through that experience in order to not be in the back of the crowd at the center. That's something we've talked about doing again. I don't know if we will. The kids have asked numerous times to do it again. They thought it was a lot of fun. They thought it was great to have that view. But I think if I were going to spend money on something to watch the fireworks, it goes right back to Kathleen's list of a fireworks cruise. We love leaving the park just before the fireworks and then hopping on one of the boats and watching the fireworks on the way back to the resort and then kind of walking up the beach and into our room. On the fireworks cruises, you can have food, you can have drinks. I think you can put, what, eight or ten people on those boats. We've talked about it before. We tried to get one for the December trip, but I just couldn't ever get an available spot. I think if you've got enough people on there, and it's really affordable. I want to say it was four and change for the fireworks cruise plus a tip where if you got eight people on there, it's only $50 a person. You've got the boat for the entire time. You can go enjoy yourselves, relax, hang out with friends without being shoulder to shoulder. That sounds like a much more attractive option to me if we were going to do it in the future. Yeah, that's definitely more appealing to me. And and it just feels more, more different. I have a hard time paying these high price tags for something that doesn't really feel like you're getting something all that unique and different. I mean, you're basically getting some small buffet style desserts that you could get at any buffet, it feels like, and then standing and and watching the fireworks. I don't know. To me, it's just not, it's not special enough to warrant paying, especially because you're not just paying for yourself. You're paying for yourself and whoever you're with and it adds up. So that's just one, that, that was a one and done for me. The one that I, that I would consider also investing in is the one that they do at California Grill when they do dessert parties up there. That seems like that could be worth a higher price tag because you're getting food from California Grill and it's open bar. And then you've got that, you know, that that private viewing deck. That's one that I might consider doing in the future. And just like that, it came back to California Grill. It always does, you know. My heart (laughs) <laughs> my heart belongs to California Grill. It's like the heart of my Disney experience. Scott, to answer your previous it. question, it looks like in April there are three at Magic Kingdom, two at Epcot, and then in May there are two at Magic Kingdom, three at Epcot, and I haven't looked at the other parks. So You're talking about much, after hours. After events. hours, I'm sorry, Yes. It looks like you could pretty much get one or two per week at any given park if you wanted to. How much are they? Uh, about $129 a person for Epcot and 145 for Magic Kingdom. Yeah, that's not too bad. I mean, I think I would probably consider that. And they are a little shorter. They're three hours total after the parks close. But like I said, we have always had really good experiences with those. I don't know if it's still the same. We haven't done one in a couple of years, but we definitely felt like we weren't rushed. We could sit back and enjoy ourselves. At the time, you got free drinks, free Mickey bars. You know, I I can eat my weight in Mickey bars, so at $7 a piece, I can make that back pretty quick. Yeah, definitely. Has anyone done any of the... I'm sorry, go ahead, Amy. I was going to say, moving over to... um... Animal Kingdom, but what were you going to say, Phil? I was just going to ask about tours. I mean, tours are on my short list of things that I want to do, and I've got a couple in mind that are definitely on my short list, but I didn't mean to interrupt, so please go ahead. Well, just staying in the parks, if we're looking at at the extra things to do in the parks, I did the Wild Africa Trek about two years ago, and it is 
my favorite thing that I have, have ever done at Disney World. It was so well done, such a fun, unique experience. It really is really one of those experiences where you just you feel like you got access to something that was unique and special. You st so you start the Wild Africa Trek back by um, in Harambe, and you basically walk on that the Gorilla Falls Trail, and essentially like you reach a, this this one like little gated area that they open up, and then all of a sudden you're walking kind of backstage, and you end up emerging like you do like they bill it as kind of like a hike that you're hiking kind of through like parts of the the safari and the first thing you encounter is the the other side of the hippo pool from where the the sart safari trucks drive and you have a guide there with you who teaches you about the hippos and then you get to um, watch the hippos be fed you can you've continue on and you walk over a you know those like rickety looking bridges that are overhead when you're driving through the safari you get to actually cross those that cross over the crocodile pit it's just a lot of fun and then you end up getting onto a safari truck they bring you onto the savannah and they park on the savannah for a while and give you some some more information, more in-depth information than what we, what you would get if you did Kilimanjaro safaris. And then they bring you to that, what looks like a little house or a hut that's that's on the savanna for lunch. And when you get up to that to that building and you're sitting, it's it's basically kind of like a covered porch. And you can see the entire savanna from that vantage point. Which it, it just also just goes to show like the magic of having the way that they built it to make it feel like it's so much bigger than it actually is with the winding roads and strategically placed trees and rocks. Because you're up on this porch and you're overlooking the savanna and to the left you've got the area where the giraffes are roaming and to the right you have the the pool where the flamingos are. And it, it's kind of amazing to see them to see that in one you know, in one kind of panoramic view from that, from that vantage point. And the food was really good. It was prepared in the kitchens at Tusker House. It was, you get those little um, tiffins that are filled with different, that's what they're called, right? Those little, that's why it's called tiffins. It's like those little metal serving dishes. You learn something new every day. They have like little wrapped sandwiches and hummus and fruit and just they're all kind of like finger foods and then all you can all you can drink pog juice a home homemade granola bar it, i mean it was really really spectacular um it lasts about i think it was lasted about 3 hours and it was i think the price now is like between 219 and 229 depending on the time of year i think that that accommodated about 10 people and i mean, there's definitely an age limit but it's not as it's not as old as you thought would think because I think that there was a little boy who was just like turned ten or something and it was his birthday gift and and he was there, but there was I when I did I there was a DVC discount and I I just I could not I I, I cannot say enough about that experience so and and I've heard the same thing with Savor the Savannah Savor the Savannah is very similar to wild africa trek but you don't do the um the hike part so you're not walking over those bridges or seeing the hippos you're basically just doing the um the truck part and then going up to that to that building and the meal is a little bit more robust plus they serve beer and wine so the wild africa trek does not serve alcohol but the savor of the savannah does and the Wild Africa Trek has the hike, but the Saver, the Savannah doesn't. So that's just, you know, if, if somebody is, is thinking about choosing between the two of them, that those are really the main differences. But I absolutely loved it. I highly recommend it. I just, I was blown away by the entire experience. And the cast members who are guiding you through it are so knowledgeable. It's just so interesting. And it, I just loved it. I think 
the Caring for Giants tour would probably be on my list prior to that, just because it's such a cool experience. We were lucky years ago, one of my wife's best friends from college became a docent at the National Zoo, and we got to go behind the scenes and play with monkeys, my favorite thing in the world, see the seals, the sea lions, the red pandas, and it was a cool experience. And I think being able to do that at Animal Kingdom would just make the kids a year. So that would definitely be on our short list if we're doing the Animal Kingdom tours. Who doesn't want to go feed a hippo? Seriously. What's the nighttime safari? What's that called? Is it called nighttime safari? Or no, safari it's a starlight, starlight, starlight safari. safari. And that happens at um, Kidani Village. And that I've done that also. And that's that's very cool, too. I mean, that's another it's like a safari truck probably accommodates again, like maybe to eight to, to 12 people. And you meet in front of Kidani Village and then they bring you onto the savannas at Kidani Village at nighttime. They give you the night vision goggles and they teach you about the animals and just a lot of information about caring for the animals at Animal Kingdom Lodge. I, that one was, I think that one might've been an hour and a half. That one's not quite as long, but I also really loved that too. I think that is, if you were to do a resort only stay, definitely something, definitely something to do. And and as we talked about it in that episode, Animal Kingdom Lodge is a great resort to stay at. If you're doing a resort only stay and adding that starlight safari is definitely worth it i think if you were to go over and like have dinner at sanaa and then book yourself a starlight safari that would be a, a really fun night i want to do all those moving over to epcot do you guys got anything over there that you've done or want to do because i have at least one i have one i want to do the behind the seeds tour same that's the one that I want to do also. I've heard so many great things about it. And it's really inexpensive as far as tours go. Isn't it like 20 some dollars, maybe? Yeah, with a DVC discount on top of it. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Are you any interest in that? What is that? It's uh, Living in the Land, the, the tour. Oh, no, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. No, I would really like to do that. I do have, a, I have a list of things that, they that are no longer available that I wanted to kind of bring up as things that I that I miss that were great extras and I'll bring up the Epcot one now since since you asked about Epcot and I've mentioned this before when we were talking about the festivals the different workshops and seminars that they used to do during the food and wine festival those really made that festival be a standout and they were really great. And I really wish that they would bring those back because I think that without them, it's just another festival with booths with, you know, some with some food. I did a great um, wine pairing at at the time it was Bistro de Paris. Now it's Monsieur Paul. I did the beer tasting dinner at Rose and Crown, and that was really great. They had um, workshops that you could do with celebrity chefs where they would teach you how to prepare a dish. I think that those were really great magical extras. I mean, I don't know if that's what they called them at the time, but I wish that they would bring those back because I think that those were really, really special and unique. And really just added like something to the, to the food and wine festival. If you want to talk about cool learning experiences that no longer exist, we can go all the way back to the Disney Institute, which was at what is now Saratoga Springs and all the cool interactive things they used to do there with cooking and art and rock climbing and you name it. It was an Eisner brainchild after a resort in upstate New York that he went to and loved. I would love to go back there and see that in action. Yeah, I think that they do. The Disney Institute, they're like, it, it exists in some other iteration. I think that they offer like online courses and I feel like it's it's mostly targeted it's like very corporate, but I do. I remember when the Disney Institute was, was the thing. And you could stay, as you said, it was before it was Saratoga Springs, but you could stay there, which is why, I mean, when you look at Saratoga Springs, it was built where the Disney Institute was and they didn't knock down all those buildings. So that's why I like that whole kind of carriage house area kind of has that look that it does because it was the Disney Institute before that. 
And then you could go over to Paradise Island in the Adventurers Club. Pleasure Island, rather, in the Adventurers Club. What's better than this? Oh, yeah, they need to bring back the Adventurers Club. Absolutely. Kungaloosh, Amy, Kungaloosh. Yeah. <laughs> so something that I have done, which I know is on a lot of people's list of something they'd like to do, is I have done the VIP tour. That was something. I was going to bring it up later. That is something that um, I, I did actually didn't pay for. It was a perk for my ex-husband's job because he worked with Google and they did a deal with Disney. And so as kind of a thank you, they gave us this VIP tour. And I mean, and look, I'm 100 percent grateful for it. You know, I had little kids at the time. I kind of <laughs> I kind of wish I could have either like in retrospect, I should have either gotten a babysitter for the day or, you know, I wish that they had been a little bit older because we just couldn't go as hard. Your girls just died a little inside hearing that. Thank you. <laughs> really. <laughs> Listen, you're the one who always It was says amazing, that but it kids, would have been so much better much. if I didn't have kids. With me. No, I, didn't, I don't mean in general. I meant that day. I meant that day because... You know, that that if you have a VIP VIP tour guide, you want you're going to like you want to go hard. You want to hit all four parks. But we kind of hit a point in the day where my kids like they were really little. And so they just lost steam and we weren't going to be able to continue going. So we we did Hollywood Studios and we did uh, Magic Kingdom with the VIP tour guide. Oh, my gosh. Talk about like feeling like a celebrity. I mean, you and at that time, I don't think that they were, I don't even think they had as many um, tour guides as they have now. It really felt like we, like people were like wondering why we got to cut the, the entire line. I mean, we literally were Who walking is that? into the exits and like going to the, to the front of the line that way. And just, we did every single ride in Magic Kingdom in like less than three hours. It was amazing. And walking around with somebody who's so knowledgeable, who was just giving us some info about the attractions or what was there previously or the backstory behind stuff. Like it was just it, that was a really amazing experience made even more amazing by the fact that we did not have to pay for it. I've priced it. It's four hundred and fifty to nine hundred dollars an hour. You can have up to 10 people, but it's a seven hour minimum. So that's between three and six thousand dollars minimum, plus you're expected to tip your tour guide. So even with 10 people, that's 300 ahead for the day. And you've got to have theme park admission. Now, the only thing that makes it somewhat reasonable for me is the annual pass. So it would just kind of sort of feel like I paid for a really expensive park ticket. But that's a tough hit on the credit card if you get an expensive day like, oh, here's $6,000 plus you got to throw your tour guide another 600 Yeah. That's a whole vacation for goodness sake. Yeah, it, it's it's very expensive, but it is very cool. I mean, it was so cool because he – our tour guide met us at at Hollywood Studios. And then when we were done at Hollywood Studios, he brought us backstage where he had parked his car and – drove us then from backstage at Hollywood Studios to backstage at Magic Kingdom, where we then entered the park from backstage. And it was, you know, my kids, like they were little, but they still thought it was really cool too, you know. Um, but it's definitely something I wish that we could have made it all day. I mean, the, the tour guide, I mean, he felt kind of bad. He was like, are you sure? I'm like, unless you're going to sit in my room while my kids take a nap. I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the limits of this of this all day tour guide are, but I don't think that that's, <laughs> that's here. Included. You just take them over there, give them a dull whip, walk them around till they take a nap, and we'll meet you in a little while. Yeah. <laughs> One of these days, we will get a plaid. I don't know, when I hit the lottery or something. I don't know, but it, it's definitely on my Disney wish list. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something if we had a large group of people, because to your point, I mean, even. Even if you split it with 10 people, you're, you're, everyone's still paying a lot out of, out of pocket. So I don't know, maybe when we all retire. There are actually groups on Facebook, and I haven't gone and looked for them, but I've been told about them, that are families with three, four, five, six people that are looking for other families to supplement their 10-person tour to split the price. So that does exist. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. So any other, uh, any, anything else in the parks that you really would want to do or have done? 
I think there's a couple. I mean, Kathleen mentioned the keys to the kingdom. That's definitely on our short list. I think the only reason we've held off is because we're usually down with the kids and there is an age limit to that tour. And I think my son would just be heartbroken if we went without him because he desperately wants to go on a Keys to the Kingdom tour. I think we're just going to wait a few years until they get a little older and do it as a family. But that's definitely one that we'll partake in. I also, if we can go way out of the parks, I want to do the walking in Walt's footsteps at Disneyland and actually get to see the apartment. That's also on my super short list. Yeah, I, I would imagine that those are two that I will end up doing at some point in my life. Can you think of anything, Scott? At the parks? Anywhere. Well, if we're staying in the parks, I mean, the obvious one for me that is an extra that most people have got to do is uh, Moonlight Magic. And I don't even want to talk about it. Huh? Neither do I for obvious reasons. What? What are you talking about? Moonlight Magic? Yeah. As an extra? Yeah. All right, did you just join the podcast? No, did you say that you haven't got to do that? No, I said a lot of people have got to oh, do it. Oh, okay. I know you can't hear me, but <laughs> no, I, I don't even want to talk about it because it's yes. a crapshoot just trying to get into it. Yeah, definitely. I have never done Moonlight Magic. I was only going to be there once. My My trip only overlapped one time with Moonlight Magic, and it ended up being during Hurricane, and it was... I don't even remember if it was canceled or not, but I had to leave. So I flew out and I, that was the same trip where I was supposed to do Mickey's not so scary again. I had to leave because of the, of the hurricane. So I don't, you know what, I, based on what I've, you know, what we've all experienced reading people's experiences online about moonlight magic, like I just don't care about it at all. Like I don't feel like it's something that I'm missing out on. I don't feel like it's something that I, have to do i don't feel disappointed when they announce a date and i'm not there prior to riviera and the point restrictions i think moonlight magic was the only perk that i really cared about for owning direct points and now that they've made it so hard to get into i mean it really is like the hunger games trying to get a ticket to a dvc event i think it's worse than run disney yeah, I, I really do. And it's it's very comparable now to a um, Christmas party or a Halloween party where you feel like it should be a special event where you can get, you know, lower wait times for rides. They do give you vouchers for snacks. But when I can't even get into a DVC event and I pay a lot of money for DVC and I see other people who don't even know what DVC is get into the event. I'm just going to stop. No, go ahead. No, I think I, it upsets me because you have four guests. You're allowed to get in and then bring four other guests. Mm -hmm. Those four other guests might not even know who Mickey Mouse is, but they can go and enjoy Moonlight Magic. And I cannot because now they, they don't have any more tickets. It's definitely a hard um, event to get into. It's a frustrating it's experience. Not, and it's then, not something that I have to do. I will try it when it's when it's available. If I don't get in, it's whatever to me. It's fine. It's just, it infuriates me of trying to get into that event. Yeah. Move on to something positive. I will just say that Scott is not alone in his frustrations. I think this is probably the one DVC perk event extra, whatever you want to call it, that is so frustrating and polarizing for people because of the need to have to get in line. You see people that are running two and three computers with two to three browsers on each computer, clicking everything as fast as they can to try and get a ticket to these events. And then when you see the events, I mean, they look like fun. I was lucky enough to briefly stop in a park once for one, courtesy of Scott and Kathleen and a rental car tire that went sideways. But yeah, I mean, I, Scott is not alone. I probably hear, you know, back to Amy's post earlier this week, this is the one event that I think I see the most complaints about. It seems like there are far more unhappy people than there are happy people. Now, granted, you know, you can always say that one negative review is worth 10 positive reviews because the positives don't post. But man, whenever they release these dates and, and release the tickets, you just watch the DVC interwebs explode. Yeah, the system is not great. But it's such a wild phenomenon because I do think that there is this social media phenomenon that has occurred because before 
all of these social media groups became so popular and people were like posting every breath that they've taken about DVC, people just went about their business and either they went or they didn't. And I don't know if it's that it has gotten so much more difficult or just that when people would try and then not get it, there was no place for them to go and rant about it or they didn't or they just thought, oh, shucks. But then there's like kind of that um, mob think that happens when you're when everyone gets has a frustrating experience or or you don't even think to be frustrated until all of a sudden frustration is bred online. I don't know. I just don't understand because I don't remember prior to 2019 this being such a bone of contention. I just don't understand what happened because the number of tickets to these events is the number of tickets. It's not like they've started letting fewer people in. It's the same number of people they can accommodate. One would argue that they're even accommodating more. How long have these events been going for? And I would continue to argue with this as we did in the post. I completely agree that there does become a mob think. Everyone devolves to the lowest common denominator. People live in that echo chamber. But I don't think there were as many divisive issues prior to 2019. I think that there have been more divisive issues, Moonlight Magic and the ticket issues. The new rides that have premiered that have allowed some DVC previews. The resale restrictions, their new foray into what we can argue in our next episode is not a deluxe category. These issues didn't exist until recently. So I think it's kind of a circular argument in that, yes, social media has intensified these issues, but I also think that Disney has been adding fuel to the fire with some of their recent decisions. But back on track, I suppose. They started in 2016. Oh. Were you going to say something, Scott? No, I just sound, I know I sound like a hypocrite because I just complained about Christmas parties and Halloween parties selling too many tickets and then not having enough tickets for Moonlight Magic, it seems like. But I think it's just the whole process on how they let people in. Maybe if they gave one ticket and two guests rather than one ticket and four guests, maybe it would allow more actual DVC members to attend the party. I don't know what the answer is, but it's not that I want them to sell more tickets. I just want them to make it more accessible to people that actually our members. I agree with your point, but like in our family, DVC is in my name. You tell me it's me and two guests. Unfortunately, one of the kids is going to figure out that they're not the favorite. Sorry, Mackenzie. <laughs> so bringing it back to a happier for not leaving the park yet, has anyone done a capture your moment? Because Emily and I have talked about this numerous times where you can actually get a photo pass photographer to come with you and do far more private and individualized photos. They give you access to places that you typically don't get to. You can come in before the park opens so you can get photos without a whole crowd in the background. It's a very short experience. You only get a 20 minute window, but it's not that expensive. And everyone I've spoken to says that in those 20 minutes, you will get more amazing usable photos than an entire vacation full of standard photo pass photographers. That might be also on our short list for one of these upcoming trips. It's on our list. I did something similar. It's before PhotoPass was a thing, but you could when it was when you could like hire a photographer to to do a photo shoot. And on the trip that I got engaged in Disney on, this was also a perk that I got from work because it, this time it was one of my perks because I worked with Family Fun Magazine, which that was a magazine that was owned by Disney, and my Family Fun rep got us the a photographer to um, do a photo shoot with us at the Magic Kingdom in front of the castle. And so we had access to to areas. I mean, it, they weren't, we were able to take pictures really early before there were a lot of people there. I mean, there was nobody in the background of these pictures. The places where we were allowed to stand were not places that you would have been able to to go by yourself. So, and I mean, and in that one, that was before everything was digital. So we had to like select which pictures we wanted printed out and then they sent them to us. So it was captured the magic before the magic was digital. And it was fun. I mean, the photographers there are great. For the money, I think you can't beat it. And as the kids are getting older, I think maybe we just want that one photo shoot while they're still young enough to to capture the magic, so to speak, just to to get them in that still kid 
stage before they get too old to want to do things like this. You know, I will say I have to I have to give a shout out to Kathleen and Scott because I used to never I, I, I hadn't added the, you know, memory maker to my annual pass because I thought like, am I going to really use it? But you guys use it all the time and you always have such great pictures. So I added it and I love having it because you see a photographer, you go take a picture. If the picture is good, awesome. And if it sucks, who cares? And it's just, you know, to me, that is something that's really worth the extra money because you can get unlimited numbers of pictures with that. And and especially I feel like for you guys, because you're local or even me, because I go so frequently to be able to kind of document every trip that you go on and and, and the different people that you go with. It's just it's it's a I think that it's worth it. I used to think that it was just like a money grab by Disney. And in some regards, I think it kind of is if you're somebody who only goes like once, but adding it onto the annual to my annual pass has definitely been something that I've enjoyed. And it's because it's because of you guys. So thanks. Oh, oh, it's definitely worth it. I totally I'll never go without it. Just this past weekend, uh, when I took my dad to Epcot, I mean, we got photos taken. I mean, those are memories. I'm looking at them now. Yeah. For us, it's a no brainer. We use it all the time. We have four annual passes, three of which are now adult annual passes because my son is above the age of 10, which still drives me nuts. But by the time you get done paying for all the annual passes, you just need one of you to have that add-on. It's not that expensive. In the grand scheme of things, it's a drop in the bucket. And some of my favorite memories and photos have come from that because like Amy said, you see a photographer, you just walk over and get a picture. And in the not so crazy spots, you're going to wait in line at Japan. You're going to wait in line on Main Street. You're going to wait in line in front of the Tree of Life. But if you keep your eyes open, there are photo pass photographers all over those parks. And I'll bet you 40% of the time, they're just standing there with their camera in their hand, just looking around those odd angles on the castle, the, you know, the strange photo spots in the background. And you don't even have to think about it. You know, you always get that picture in front of the castle on Main Street. But we were walking, I think, two months ago through the Fantasyland expansion and I was with my father-in-law and my daughter. It's like, hey, there's a photo pass photographer in front of Belle and the Beast Castle. Go take a photo. And there she is with her grandfather making these big beast claws. One of my favorite photos is Emily, myself, Scott, and Kathleen in front of the Christmas tree. We have gotten amazing photos that you know you use on desktops, on Christmas cards, just to go through on a regular basis. And especially when you've got all your friends down there, I mean, there's no secret. We've made some amazing friendships through Disney and through this group. And to be able to have a photo of Scott and Kathleen and Em and I in front of the Christmas tree is just amazing. You know, Kathleen put together that whole collage of all of her friends and the photos they've got. And that's just all a matter of giving them, what is it, a hundred bucks on top of your annual passes. So if you're already paying for an annual pass or if you go on a regular basis, by all means, I have photos of my kids from the time they're 18 months old until today. And that's all courtesy of having that one little add on. I don't think we'll ever go without it. I mean, that also includes the ride photos. So those are always fun to look at too. And then it becomes a game. What faces can you make? Because you know where the spots are. Like our favorite Mm. game is we know we're going to pass it. Are we going to be scared? Are we going to make muscles? Are we going to pretend we're asleep? It's just, you don't have to worry about going back after it later. And the photos themselves are not inexpensive if you have to go and get them individually. So now you're having to be careful and selective about where you're having the photos. You just go back and every trip we take, there's 75, 85 photos just sitting there in that folder and you just grab the ones you like and move on. Yep, I download them right to my phone. So let's talk a little bit about things to do outside the park that probably aren't really categorized as magical extras by Disney standards, but are the the things that you would do that are kind of separate from your from your park days if you were to do a resort only stay or if you were to take it a, a non park day what are your some of your favorite things to do or or things that you would like to do that are not in the parks before we move on just one quick aside because miss mckenzie will be infuriated if i don't mention bibbidi bobbidi boutique we have been promising her for years that we would let her get all done up and she finally scored nines across the board in one of her gymnastics competitions. So guess where we are going in December? Nice. Nice. 
Well, and that's, uh, again, a perfect time that to, to use Memory Maker because she'll be all done up and then you can take all of these great pictures with her in her in her princess getup. So that's fun. Okay, now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Sorry. <laughs> I think, that's okay. Uh, I think I would, one of the main things for me would be the spa at the resort. Like if you're having like a, a resort a resort day or, or something like that. I mean, I know there's only one spa now, which is at the Grand Floridian. Or, I mean, I think they do have one at the Swan, but, or the Dolphin, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if Saratoga is ever going to open again, but I think that's a nice extra. I really in- enjoyed the spa at the Dolphin. In the past, I had been to the spa at the Grand Floridian several times, and I was I went to the spa I did go to the spot Saratoga Springs when it was open, but of my three experiences or, you know, the, those three locations, the one at the dolphin is my favorite just because it has a more spa like atmosphere and the waiting room is just like more serene. It's bigger. It's like a little bit more, it's very Zen, which I really like, but you know, I have a tendency to really not, go to the spa on my Disney vacations, even if I'm doing like a low key trip or if I'm by myself, because I don't know why I think part of it is that spas are just so expensive, but the spa at the dolphin does offer a DVC discount, which is nice. The one at um, the grand Floridian does not. So that's just for our listeners, just, just a little, a little tidbit. Something that I, that I did a couple years ago was I saw the new Cirque du Soleil. I I saw Lanuba twice when it, when Lanuba was there, and then now Drawn to Life is the new Cirque du Soleil show, and I absolutely loved it. I think that that is something that if you're going with older kids or even younger kids who are into theater or you know acrobatics, it it is fun. To, it's it's a little it's weird, but it's very fun to watch, and the storyline of this. The Cirque du Soleil drawn to life is just so touching. I absolutely love that. And I think it's something that is is definitely worth seeing. If it's something that that you're into and that you're considering, I would say that you should do it. And I believe that there are certain times when they also offer a DVC discount. Did anybody talk about Bay Lake and the boats you can take out just randomly? Did we already discuss that? Like you can just take the boat out per hour and... Go have a nice time on Bay Lake. Not a fireworks cruise, but like a just a random... Like a pontoon boat? Yeah. So they still have the pontoon boats. We did one rental on Crescent Lake years ago because I was recreating a photo of my father and I from the very early 80s when you could rent boats at uh, Disney Springs, which at the time I think was the Buena Vista shopping center or something village. along those lines. The shopping village, thank you. But I have heard recently that everything but the pontoon boats was sold off either during or after COVID. All the little Boston whalers are gone. I know the sea racers are gone. So I think all that's left right now are actually the pontoon boats, which is a little heartbreaking for me because those little whalers, we own one, uh, were a lot of fun just to kind of putter up to Hollywood Studios and back down to Crescent Lake and the same thing around Bay Lake. That was kind of the perfect little boat to do so. Like sea racers are actually on my list of of things that are no longer available, but that I just wanted to give a little nod to because those were really fun. I rented those a couple of times with my kids when they were younger on at Seven Seas Lagoon. And it's, what was cool about that was that you could also then cross over to Bay Lake. So you had a very large area to explore. And I think that to echo your sentiment, Phil, I think it's a shame that they got rid of those. But I would be interested in, in, and I mean, we've tried so many times when there has been a larger group of people who were going to be at Disney at the same time to try to organize getting a pontoon, but it just, it, it has never worked out. But that is super affordable. I mean, that is something that could, you know, for eight people could be like 10 bucks a person. So it's definitely something that's on my list of, of things to do. And lucky for you guys, you have a friend who makes a living driving a boat and doesn't drink. So it's like having the perfect little built-in boat driver for you. Welcome aboard. 
<laughs> yeah, you say the sea racers, it's heartbreaking. I, I feel terrible. We had told our kids trip after trip after trip. Yep, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. They desperately wanted to take the sea racers out, and then they got rid of the sea racers, and I will never hear the end of it, and I don't think they realize how guilty I feel about that. But if you go back far enough, I mean, you had the canopy boats, you had the bobalong boats, you had the sea racers, you had pon uh, pontoon boats, you had Hobie cats, you had sunfish. Over the years, there have been a number of boats you could rent, and that's just no longer an option. I think it might have something to do with the little mini dinosaurs they continually find in there. Does anybody remember, do they still do the Grand Yacht at the Grand Floridian? The Grand One, I haven't seen her in a while. I heard she was out for a refurbishment, and I have the feeling that is the same company that supplied the whalers and everything else. They're all Brunswick boats, and I have the feeling that contract may have run out and they did not renew it. Oh. We're going to have to try to set one up again, see if we can get it, the pontoon boat. You can also rent those swan paddle boats over at the Swan and Dolphin. Yeah. I which I are kind of... Yeah. Kind of work. <laughs> when you want to exercise while you relax. <laughs> what about dining experiences? That, that They've got a lot of food and dining experiences that we've just started to look into. I know they have a sangria one at Coronado that I think Emily would really enjoy. Have you guys done any of those? No, we really want to do that. Um, what sangria was that called? University. University. That's right, yeah. It's not expensive. I want to say it's... It's like 69 or $79 a person. You get three sangrias. They give you the whole history of sangria. They give you the three that they make for Coronado with three bridges. You get to try them out, and then you get to mix your own. That sounds like a fairly inexpensive way to have fun in an afternoon. I'd be happy to send Emily over there with you guys. What about the food and wine experience that's going to be at the Swan and Dolphin? Funny you should mention that. I think we have plans for that, don't we? I do believe so. I think that's going to be a great time. They also have the La Cava experience at, in Mexico and Epcot. I mentioned that, what, one or two podcasts ago, Len Testa was there and just raved about it. And I love tequila. and I just don't drink, but I love tequila. And being able to go over there, he said they atomize the tequilas. They make you breathe it in. Then you wait a minute. Then you breathe it in again. Then you try it with different foods. He said it was an absolutely amazing experience. That one's a little more expensive. I want to say that's just shy of $200 a person to go in and do that one. The one that I um, have at the top of my list is the one is the wine tasting that they do at Wine Bar George. That's Tom and Pam from the DVC Clubhouse Facebook group. They did it recently and raved about it. And that is definitely something that's right up my alley. So that's that's something that I that I intend to to do it probably at some point this year. If I can squeeze it into maybe I'll do that when I'm there in May. It'll be my Mother's Day present to myself. <laughs> Kathleen, you can go to the spa and I'll I'll go to the I don't know if they offer it on Sundays though. They probably don't because they do brunch. I think they only offer it on Mondays. I would like to do I'll that. I'll have to look into it. Do you think they have really good wine glasses there? You wouldn't have to bring I know your own. that they do. <laughs> I don't have to bring my own wine glass there. I I can use their wine glasses. But something I I need to give a, another shout out to a to an old experience that has not come back after COVID, and that is afternoon tea at the Grand Floridian. That is another event that I I mean I've done that, I've done it so many times, and I I've done it with my mom and my sister. I did it with with Allie when she was a little girl. I did it with a friend of mine and her daughter and my daughters. And I mean, I've just done it in all different kind of on so many different trips with so many different people. And every single time it has just all that's that's another one of one of my favorite things to do at Disney. And I really, really wish that they would bring that back to the Grand Floridian because it is such a good event. And that was daily. I mean, that was just a regular reservation. Uh, that's another one Miss McKenzie would die for. She's asked to do it, and we just haven't found the time. But if that comes back, that's one I, I might have to invest in and send her along because she does love her tea parties. Well, they do the one that when the tea room was open, they did like the Alice in Wonderland tea for for little kids. But they have the regular tea. And that isn't anything like that's not kitschy or it's not character centric. It's just that's a high tea. 
it's a high tea and it is i mean the food is excellent the tea is great the service is amazing it's i mean it's one of those things that makes you feel really kind of fancy you know after you open and close your blinds at old key west your roman oh. shades then you can head over and get some tea at the grand floridian tea room and then you're really fancy i was gonna ask what resort is that at that makes you feel fancy the crown jewel that's right thank you phil thank you, you know, interestingly i don't know if it's going to come back and i only say that because i feel like the floridian is undergoing a change in theme we're seeing even 1900 park fair came back but the characters are different it's not quite the victorian theme and ambiance that they've had in the past so i wonder with the orchestra being gone and things changing over there if they're not veering away from that whole aesthetic. The resort still has a lot of Mary Poppins touches, so it would make sense still to have a tea room, I think. I'd be happy to see it come back. I just, I wonder what direction that resort is going in as far as the aesthetic and, and what they're pushing there. You know, that tea room is, I have had the best mimosa that I've ever had in my life at that tea room because they put they call it the Grand Mimosa. And I think you, you can get it at the um, Grand Floridian Cafe. You can. But they put, a, they put a floater of Grand Marnier on top of the mimosa. And, it's, and then they put a strawberry in it. Yep. It's can a we bit get a long chef's time kiss? since I've done Chef's Kiss. I, it, yeah, it's been a long <laughs> I knew time, it was so. coming. I was going to say, I just, that is one that is on my list of things that, that I wish, really wish that they would bring back. Because I think anybody who hasn't experienced it, should have a chance one of the things that we haven't talked about yet that i really enjoy is the water parks i don't know if you guys ever been i've only been to typhoon lagoon i have not been to blizzard beach we have never gone but now that the open uh, what the check-in day is going to allow you free access to the water parks that may change just to give us something to do on that that first afternoon but up until now we I'm not typically a water park person, and I love swimming. I love the water. I was on the swim team. I was a lifeguard. I, I work on the water. I'm probably more comfortable in the water than I am out of it, but we've just never wanted to take the time away from the resort or the parks to go over there. But with this new offer, I could see that maybe being a possibility in the future. I think it's, I think it's a good time. I mean, you, you're not a, a big swimmer, but you still enjoy it. Yeah, I like I'll save you. It. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate that. Typhoon Lagoon. I thought it was nice. It is. I thought, you know, the uh, the wave pool, the the lazy river, and they have, what's that called? The uh, H2O, the glow. Yeah, H2O glow that. nights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would do that. I agree with you, Phil. I mean, I, I paid for the, the um, water park once. I might go back because it's free because I don't, I don't need to go for the full day. I think going there for two or three hours is enough. And because of that, that's why I never wanted to pay. But if I can get over there for two or three hours, it might be fun, especially with, the uh, uh, again, I think that lends itself more to a group experience um, because there are things that you can, you know, like the tubes that you can go on with a bunch of people. I, I mean, I think, I feel like that is a place that is fun. And the one time that I went, it was myself and my friend and our kids. There were, so there were six of us and, and we had a, we had fun and. I know that I've told this story before, but I got crushed in the wave pool by a wave that dragged me along the bottom of the wave pool, which is made of concrete. There's no sand down there. And my knee scraped along the bottom of that pool and I emerged with a wound and I still have the scar to this day. So <laughs> it's an emotional scar and those take the longest to heal. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, since, since living down here, we've added it to our annual pass just for those days where you just want to go cool off for a couple hours. You're not spending, you know, just $80 to get in for two hours. Yeah. So it's nice to have on the pass. Have you guys done the winter Summerland mini golf? We never have. I haven't done that one, but I've, I've done the mini golf at the, um, at the Swan. And that's, you know, it's, it's fun for, for what it is. I mean, it's not like the greatest mini golf course that you're ever going to play, but it's kind of fun. And it, it's fun if, if you arrive later in the day and especially if you don't have an annual pass and you want 
to kill a couple of hours and you know you don't want to spend money to get go into the park it's it, it's it's a fun way to, to for a family to spend a couple hours the waits do get pretty long i mean that is the one thing you can't reserve it in advance so when you get over there you could have to wait like an hour or so and it's not the type of thing where they'll text you to tell you to come back so you kind of have to hang out lurk around the area i know years ago if you booked a room in ticket package it used to come with a free pass to get into mini golf for everyone in the party but it's just been so long since we booked that package i don't know if that's still the case i don't know either i i actually i think it might still be so anything else i mean we're over time here is there anything else that you guys can think of at the resorts or or at you forgot one at epcot what's that what's that the um the epcot seas the dive quest yes so yeah i mean as an avid diver i've looked at it i think the only drawback to me is having now gone diving on both sides of the equator on top of the equator everyone i speak to that has done it says it is the coldest dive they have ever done in their lives and it's brutal but i've considered it and it's not as far as dive experiences go that expensive i've paid a lot more i want to say it's mid 200s I think it would be a lot of fun. I just don't know if I want to get freezing cold in a six mil wetsuit after diving in Belize and Venezuela and all those other amazing places. I've known one person that I work with that's done it, and she's actually done it a few times. But that's it. I always forget about that one. How could you forget about Uncle Jesse in the tank proposing at Coral Reef? That's true. Uncle Jesse. I shocked my kids the other day. They had watched the reboot of Full House. So I pulled up the Beach Boys video that was shot at the Grand Floridian the week before it opened. And I had the kids watching it. I said, okay, what do you recognize in this video? And I completely forgot that John Stamos was playing the bongos in the background. I thought, sure, they would recognize the Floridian. It took like three tries for them to recognize the Floridian. But man, if they didn't see Uncle Jesse in the first 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say two things that we haven't brought up and i don't know if if you guys have done either of them but those amphibious cars at disney springs and then also the the hot air balloon the aerophile or whatever it's called i want to do the hot you, air you couldn't pay me enough you won't do it with me to get my ass <laughs> on that balloon i'm sorry but i've seen that thing on a windy day i mean if one of you want to do it with me i want to do it more power to you I'll send the kids up with you. They have been begging to do both. I have no problem with heights. I want to go skydiving. My wife won't let me because we have kids. But I would go up in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lost my train of thought there. They also want to do the Amphicars. I think the Amphicars, the drawback is it's expensive. It is not Very cheap expensive. to rent an Amphicar. And I'm sure with all of my contacts around the country, I could find someone that owns one over in the Great Lakes somewhere and take them for a ride. And you could do a duck know. boat tour in Boston. It's basically yeah. the same thing, just on a larger scale. <laughs> yeah, I've seen too many duck boat accidents. I'm good, thanks. Don't you get a discount if you eat at the boathouse? I think. I mean, do. even I if the discount was ten percent, it's still expensive. Yeah, I mean, it's something, but right, it's two hundred and some odd dollars for a little spin around the waterway, isn't it? It's, it's not cheap, yeah. if I remember correctly. It's not cheap, and it's short. I mean, you're just like to your point. You kind of just do a loop around. Mm -hmm the water by in between Saratoga Springs and, and Disney Springs. At Disney Springs, you can get a much more fulfilling experience with an extra at Amaretz where you can decorate a cake for one ninety nine a person. That better be a dollar ninety nine. That is, is that one hundred and ninety nine. Yes. No, thank you. All right. Are there any others we missed? Are we allowed to talk about um, Vero Beach? I mean, I know we're talking about on property, but the one cool thing when we were at Vero Beach that I really wanted to do was the sea turtle, where you can go and check out the sea turtle nest, and they tell you all about that. I think if anybody ever goes to Vero Beach, that's one thing that you really have to do. That's one of the coolest things about Vero is the, uh, you know, the, the sea turtles and everything that they do there to conserve the nests. I thought you were going to talk about Victoria and Alberts, and then the next thing that comes out of your mouth is turtles at Vero Beach. When I heard the V, I was like, oh, here goes Scott talking about Grand Floridian again. <laughs> but I will say 
Victoria and Albert's, it, I mean, that is kind of like, because that's such an elevated dining experience, that is kind of like a magical extra in my, like, in my book. I don't know what Disney calls it, but that is kind of just like an elevated experience that I think that anybody who is a little bit of a foodie um, should definitely try. I'm a lot of a foodie, but I'm also a cheap foodie. It would be a total waste <laughs> of money for me. Yeah. Kathleen is that woman that just liked the bread. Yeah, you'd be like the lady that I told you who was basically yeah. like she's she wouldn't eat anything and they were like, What what can we make you? We will make you anything. She's like, You can just bring me some more bread. <laughs> I was like, Oh my yep. gosh, this woman is paying over two hundred bucks or you know, it's like two ninety five or or whatever it was, and she was basically eating each of the different <laughs> breads that they brought out with the courses. I could just hear her saying with each course, they bring it out, they present it, and she goes, nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. Do you have any mac and cheese? Yeah, she was very quiet every time they brought something out, and she would kind of push it around with her fork. I was by myself, <laughs> so I was observing a lot, and I there was a lot to observe over at that table. All right, guys, I feel we like even if we ha- even if we do have more to talk about, I don't think anybody cares to listen to us ramble anymore. <laughs> so we should probably shut her down. All right, guys. Well, thank you again for listening. As we always say at the end of the episode, if you liked what we had to offer, and quite frankly, we don't care even if you didn't like what we had to offer, if you could do us a favor, run over to Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star review, a like, words of encouragement, we'd appreciate it. Amy? And again, you can find us on Facebook at DVC Clubhouse to join in the conversation over there. Also, subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can find us on TikTok and Instagram. And until next time, we will DVC you real soon. Bye. Bye, guys. See you guys. And so our journey comes to an end. Oh, no, please. Can't we go back to page one and do it all over again? We started this thing together. And that's how we finish it. Because that, my friends, is where the magic lives. Happily ever!